Hello and welcome, all you Grateful Dead. I'm the Green Scorpion, and who boy, Weapons Month 5 really took it out of me for a few months. While I was regaining my energy, not to mention on vacation getting engaged, the countdown portion of my channel was silent as the grave. I knew I wanted to warm up before jumping into my next big marathon of videos, so I asked the members of my Patreon Discord for a topic to inject some life back into my writing team. And we voted on many worthy suggestions. But it's only fitting that we revive with a list about necromancers. Coming from the ancient Greek words necros, meaning dead body, and mancheia, which means divination, necromancy started as an aspect of shamanism, based on communing with the souls of the dead and practiced all throughout the world. I'll leave it to your imagination how successful they were. Like any spiritual practices outside of Roman Catholicism, necromancy became mythologized as a dark art not to be tampered with, and had its place cemented in fiction in 1937 when Tolkien referred to Big Bad Sauron as a necromancer in The Hobbit. In popular culture, necromancy wasn't just used for the purpose of seeking wisdom or closure. It was wielding the powers of life and death like two edges of the same sword. In some media, necromancers are synonymous with spellcasters in general, though I prefer the Dungeons & Dragons take, where it's presented as one of the eight schools of arcane magic, alongside enchantment, transmutation, and the like. How this power manifests can vary, sometimes depicted as noxious green fog, silver light, creeping frost, or gorgeous cherry blossoms depending on the artistic direction. Practitioners of necromancy can transfer and alter souls, hasten the effects of aging, or, most famously, raise the dead, be it as perfect resurrections or a mindless zombie army. On that note, while I did narrow down my list pretty quickly, it was putting them in order that was the real nightmare. Do I treat this like an archetypes list, like with berserkers, or is this a surprise epilogue to weapons month, the weapon being death magic? I guess, both? In order to rank the reviled revivers, I fortunately found four metrics of mortal mastery. First is defenses. Necromancy is a good build if you want to hide in your domain behind your undead legion, so if that's your MO, how hard is it for invaders to get to you? Second, how are you in an actual fight? Are your spells still useful when your foe has fought through your first fetid phalanx? Third, versatility. When you can move life and death in any direction, I want to see that used creatively. And four, scale. While some necromancers can take over a town, others can threaten a country or even a kingdom, maybe even the entire world. With that out of the way, which warlocks laugh loudest in the face of death? We're gonna find out or die trying. I'm the Green Scorpion, and these are the Top 10 Video Game Necromancers. Well, if necromancers can move the flow of life in all directions, I suppose the best place to start would be... straight. Many RPGs feature spells that, rather than doing damage or applying an effect, endow a target with immediate termination. These instant death spells often come with either a delay or low accuracy. And now I'm wondering if Thwack is a form of necromancy, but anyway. They're especially fitting for Reaper-themed characters, bringing tidings of non-negotiable annihilation. And I want to go easy on this trope today, as it's kind of a separate category. This doesn't scream necromancer the same way as, say, Shaft from Castlevania does. But I can make an exception for my boy Thanatos, the Chthonic God of Death. Now you might be thinking, but I thought Hades was the God of Death. No, no. Hades is the god of the dead. He controls the realm all souls go to, like a grumpy landlord. Thanatos rules the concept of death itself, the process of demise, the actual event of being unalived. He's death incarnate. And he also happens to be the childhood friend and possible ex-boyfriend of the game's hero, Prince Zagreus. The first time he showed up in one of my runs, I'll admit I was preparing myself for what might be a hard as balls boss fight, but turns out he's not actually here to kill you, as easy as that would be for him. Instead, Thanatos tests your resolve in a killing contest. Whoever offs the most enemies wins, which can be difficult depending on your build at the time. Both of his attacks work on a delay, either marking a target to take critical damage a few seconds later, or creating an area of effect, said effect being death. Thanatos is one of the few characters on this list that doesn't reanimate corpses as part of his skill set, but he's very adept at the most simple application of death magic, and he's never had a need to do anything else, though in theory he can also keep a soul alive just by neglecting to reap it. Unfortunately, as powerful as he's implied to be, I kept old Than low on this list since we don't actually get to see much of his power outside of these inflexible demonstrations. 
It's also worth mentioning that you only meet him on his home turf. Like Zagreus, he gets sick if he's up on the surface for too long, and it's possible these bloodless revenants he slays are easier for him to dispatch, seeing as they're already dead. He's unaffected by Zag's attacks, but that might be more of a no-friendly fire mechanic, as we're told that he was once overpowered by Sisyphus of all people, resulting in death being turned off for the entire world for a period of time. Still, writing enemies a one-way ticket to Tartarus is a scary prospect, and I'm glad I'm not on the receiving end of it. But then again... Death has never looked so good. That is one sexy psychopop. There's been some debate in the past if using technology and science allows a character to count as a mancer, like the pyro being a pyromancer rather than just a guy with a flamethrower. Fortunately, we don't have many non-magic necrokinetics to consider, but I did find one. Well, more than one. You'll see what I mean. Azure Striker Gunbolt goes the comic book route of describing ridiculous superpowers as some form of biological evolution. Our electrokinetic protagonist does battle with a series of superhuman adepts who are working for the villainous Sumeragi group. Missions follow a standard Mega Man type formula, but the Stratacombs are a little different. Run by the Eternal Envy Elise. Though she's thrown in with the rest of the level boss gallery, in terms of lore, Elise is one of the most important adepts under Sumeragi's control. With the power of Rebirth, Elise manipulates the souls of anyone around her, though her meek personality wasn't to Sumeragi's liking. So they locked her in a secret facility to increase her aggression, and... it worked. The Stratacombs are now filled with her zombified victims, the very scientists that had experimented on her. So, yeah, good work, Elise. First zombie army on the list. Pushing through them, you arrive at Elise's chamber to find that her trauma resulted in dissociative identity disorder, leading to a truly ridiculous feat of necromancy. Not just her personality, but her very soul is split, and she's able to create an exact copy of her own body to serve as a vessel for the separate part of herself. That's some Voldemort Horcrux shenanigans right there! And though I don't think she did it on purpose, that's one for the record books and their snake theme for some reason. Probably an homage to Caduceus, the staff with two entwining snakes carried by Hermes in Greek mythology, and often used to represent healing or rebirth. At first I thought most of her moves were just following the serpentine motif rather than using necromancy, but according to the wiki, she's actually reanimating the corpses of small cobras to use these attacks. And when you deflect these kunai, they turn back into little snake corpses. Then there's her Gorgon Stare, which can be described as her halting your life functions for a moment, thus petrifying you? Sounds fake, but okay. Here's the real kicker though. If you defeat one of the twin snakes, the other will use RESURRECTION to bring them back at a quarter max health. This means you need to defeat both sisters simultaneously, with a very small window in between. That's kinda hard to manage when you're being pelted with reptilian missiles. Could this get any worse? Well, about 50% worse, actually. In the game's finale, Elise resurrects her fellow adepts for this game's obligatory boss rush, and it turns out Elise had a third body locked away in cryo storage. This one's completely immortal and will resurrect her sisters as many times as it takes to wear you down. This would have gone on forever without an assist from Copen, whose text specifically negates all Septima powers. Glad to be rid of her, but I wouldn't be surprised if there's a fourth doppelganger waiting in the grass somewhere. If Metal Gear has taught me anything, it's that there's always another snake. I remember playing Castle Crashers in 2008 and feeling nostalgic for the heyday of Newgrounds. That was 13 years ago. And now, I can feel nostalgic about Castle Crashers itself, which holds as a madcap take on the beat-em-up genre. You spend the game roaming the countryside, chasing after the evil wizard and his right-hand man, the Necromancer. Maybe resurrect a better PR guy. Seriously, what a name. As on the nose as he is, he's certainly deserving of the recognition. Thanks to his Meta Knight wings and the power of cutscenes, Necro is out of sword's reach for most of your adventure, stopping only to occasionally sprout some skeletons in your path to slow you down. He also swings by the domicile of the Cyclops after you've bested him, reviving him from a molten death so that he, and by extension his cone-headed best friend, can serve as one of the game's end bosses. And if you can beat them, you'll finally have your chance against the Necromancer himself. 
And I hope you've been level grinding because he's considered by many to be the toughest boss in the game by attrition alone. Good god, Necromancer. When's the last time you cleaned your room? There are bodies everywhere. I can't even see the floor. And he plans to add you to the collection by repurposing his carry-on carpet into a trash mob. These zombies include every humanoid enemy type in the game and move at hyperactive speeds. If you're not good at air combo locking, they will overwhelm you. And health potions don't do much if he doesn't give you a moment to drink them. But Necromancer seems to have limited spell slots because after two waves, he touches down to fight you himself for the remainder of the encounter. That's the only thing keeping him so low, honestly, because as cartoony as this game is, this is one of the quickest death by zombie waves I've ever seen. This chibi Sauron doesn't mess around. And if you have the DLC or play the remaster, Necromancer is also available as a playable character. And while all playable characters control the same, they have little variation in their spells that make each one slightly unique. Necromancer's splash attack is a mosh pit of reanimated arms that, very unique to him, pops enemies into the air to start air combos. He can also spawn kamikaze skeletons on the spot, and if fired downward from the air, these bone bombers will hit the ground running, making them more useful than most aerial spells. Personally, I'll stick to Green Knight, but it is cool that he's here, even if you don't get the wings or the full extent of his necromantic powers. Castle Crashers isn't a subtle game. Each character just takes whatever they're supposed to do and hits you over the head with it. But few necrotic boss fights have made my blood pump quite like this one. Opposite side of the spectrum from the frantic action of Castle Crashers, Wargroove is a slow-paced, highly tactical war game inspired by Advanced Wars and Fire Emblem featuring four fearsome factions. You start the game controlling Princess Mercia of Cherrystone as your kingdom is invaded by the ruthless ranks of the Felheim Legion, led by Valder, Lord of the Dead. Let's talk world building for a moment. Felheim as a country is populated almost entirely by the undead, all raised from their graves through the power of the Fel Gauntlet. Only one who holds the gauntlet can be deemed worthy to rule over the macabre masses. Valder grew up during a period of history when the gauntlet was lost, allowing the undead to spread unchecked and making things pretty dangerous for mortal kind. But Valder did what it took to survive, and in his teenage years, the gauntlet presented itself to him, recognizing his resolve and relinquishing rulership. Now 34, Valder runs an entire nation of the dead, most of which he created himself, and all of them battle-ready. This includes skeleton swordsmen, pikemen, archers, hulking colossi, and Ragna, a Frankensteinian monster built from the bodies of history's greatest warriors. Valder also has an alliance with vampires much older than him, and the Deep Ones, from whom he raised skeletal sea turtle mounts so that they could serve as his navy. Far from mindless zombies, Valder's soldiers are able to communicate and reason when Valder is away, but will follow any direct command from him in an instant. True, his troops act the same way as any of the living troops of any other faction, but think about that. Raised from the dead, they're all as capable as any normal person. How often do you see a necromancer skeleton army that can fly hot air balloons or operate a trebuchet? They can even talk! Though, most people aren't fluent in chatter chatter. In terms of gameplay, one thing you have to understand about Wargroove is that all of the commanders are statistically identical. So, on one hand, Valder's as strong as a dog. But he's also as strong as Koji's mech. He can reliably take out multiple units of foot soldiers and go toe-to-toe -to -toe with enemy giants if he's at full health. The distinguishing factor between each of the commanders is their groove, a special technique that they can use after charging. And Valder's lets him summon a swordsman unit. Okay, a little underwhelming. It's implied that he can resurrect anything, but in-game you can only make the simplest unit there is. But don't sell it short. Swordsmen deal critical damage when standing next to their commander, so there's synergy there. Plus the dread swords spawn ready to immediately move, which can be insanely useful for attacking far-off enemies. And this groove charges so damn fast. Feed Valder one kill and he's probably got his meter full. So, the point of comparison with the Castle Crashers boss is a little tough. Valder's zombie waves are moving slower, but he's also controlling far more at once, up to an entire country's worth. And it's not that slow if you do the math, each Dreadsword unit being four skeletons, forming as quickly as every other turn, or in his boss fight in story mode, every turn, because he freaking cheats. It's not as versatile as some of his contemporaries, but the skeletons themselves are varied and make for a continental threat and Valder leads them all with an iron fist. I mean, literally, he actually uses a metal hand to do it. He's actually a pretty nice guy once you get to know him. 
Behold the fell gauntlet! I distinguish between a Reaper and a Necromancer largely on a character's purpose. Thanatos, despite fitting the minimum qualifications of a Necromancer, embodies a Reaper for his role in doling out death and preserving the natural flow of the universe, whereas most Necromancers in fiction are either fanatical worshippers of some death god or eccentric experimenters, purposefully defying these rules of nature. That's part of what makes the Necromancer class from Diablo so interesting. They still use the title of Necromancer, but they exist to maintain the planet's balance between life and death. So when the fallen star awakens the dead in Condorus, that balance is disturbed, and the Necromancer sets out to put the dead to rest, even if he has to wake a few more up to do so. The Necromancer class was first introduced in Diablo 2, but was reworked as a DLC class in Diablo 3, the canon version of the character being named Jules. This is also the character used to represent the class in Heroes of the Storm, his trusty scythe perfect for finishing the job on any undead, and his baggy gray skin demonstrating how close to death he is himself. His powers in Diablo 3 manifest in four main ways. First there's Blight, here representing less a physical toxin like the Witch Doctor might use, and more the creeping effects of time. Second is Frost, as death in these games is a very cold and isolating sensation. This could be a reference to the game's developer Blizzard, who in itself is an entity of darkness that sucks the life out of those who work for it. HA! GOT HE! HA! Third, we have Blood Magic. Jules can siphon blood out of his enemies to heal himself, or sacrifice his own blood, and by extension his HP, for more powerful skills. Last is a variety of bone manipulation, using them as spears or armor, even converting corpses in the environment into mortuary missiles. In another game world, these kinds of spells could fall under Poison, Cryomancy, Hemomancy, etc., but the theming with Jules' whole kid does tie everything together as a necromancer. And, of course, Jules can raise the dead, traveling with a posse of up to seven skeletal minions. He can raise the departed as skeletal mages, or melt a bunch of flesh together into hulking golems. He can even devour the dead to restore the essence needed to cast his spells. That's why I like Jules so much as a necromancer. While previous entries on this list use their necromancy one way or the other, either mostly killing or mostly reviving, Jules utilizes a full spellbook of necromancy, weaving life force in all directions depending on what he needs at the time. He turns corpses into projectiles, enemies into armor, health into damage, and minions into his own MP pool, incorporating sick death, cold death, bloody death, and pointy death. Not just a circle of life, but a mandala of demise and rebirth. Jules stands as one of the most iconic necromancers. Perhaps the most obvious example of this trope, but strangely, also one of the most creative. Now if that's not creative enough for you, our number 5 goes into bizarre, pun-infested territory. Give it up for the Necrodancer, titular villain of Crypt of the Necrodancer which combines roguelike dungeon crawling with a rhythm game, the result being one of the most addictive, stressful, and awesome indie games I've ever played. Seriously, check out the highlights of my Twitch streams for this game. You can actually see my hair grain to the beat. Once upon a time, a fame-seeking minstrel named Octavian stumbled upon the Golden Lute, which not only helped him invent trap music, but also could weave his melodic influence through all creatures living and dead. It also made him immortal, but only as long as he kept playing and all the while it drained his humanity until he became a blue bearded ghoul with an obsession with raising minions and giving them terribly punny names. While not all of them look undead, every monster face in the crypt is either revived by the Necrodancer or has had its soul altered into servitude through a combination of necromancy and bardic performance. So while Valder's skeletal forces were fairly diverse and able to operate complex ships and siege weapons, he can't beat the sheer variety of the Necrodancer's morbid menagerie. You've got the usual skeletons with shields, or on horses, and the Necrodancer installed these coffins that will spawn them on infinitum. Then there's the fully fleshed facsimiles of harpies, trolls, dragons, fire and ice elementals, monkeys that can body jack you, nightmares that flow with darkness, mummies making mummies, he'll even zombify the shopkeeper from time to time. Not to mention the area bosses like King Konga and his Konga line of zombies, or his personal Grim Reaper, Death Metal. But the real kicker with the Necrodancer isn't his minions, it's his effect on living hearts. All of his pets are altered so that their hearts beat at a specific rhythm. 
and when you enter his multi-story dungeon, you too are cursed with this heartbeat. This forces you to make all of your movements, attacks, and item usages on tempo with the dungeon's background music, turning your spelunking adventure into Dance Dance Revolution. I know that sounds silly next to the multifaceted talents of Jules, but I don't think we should undersell what a powerful, if frankly bizarre, display of necromancy this is. I've seen necromancers set a timer on how long a target has to live, but never a timer that decides HOW a target lives. And he uses it to subject you to his endless concert, or if you're good enough, eventually turn you into one of his undead champions. That's what he did to Dorian, the last hero to attempt to steal his loot, and Necrodancer blasted him into a state of mindless never-death as his bodyguard, the Dead Ringer. The Necrodancer spent considerable rehearsal time on his impregnable defenses, but even with his back against the wall, he's no softy. In your first encounter, you have to use both Cadence and Dorian, arranging them just right to trigger the explosives and destroy Octavian's stage. But all the while, he's constantly reanimating more minions to attack you. Like, do you mind, dude? This is already hard enough. And with his feet on the ground, he'll still teleport around and reanimate on every beat. So there's a good chance his minions will finish you off before you can pin him down. Even when killed, he takes the secrets of the loot to his grave, constantly forcing our heroes to revive him so they can learn how to destroy the damn thing. If you've played the game, you know how hard it is to retire this Spoonie Bard. You can stop an avalanche, but you can't stop a beat. Necromancy has a strong presence in League of Legends, with the Shadow Isles factoring into the origins of many champions. Karthus, Hecarim, Kalista, Thresh, not to mention Viego and his Black Mist storming through Runeterra in the latest plot arc. I still haven't decided how I feel about Viego, so my judgment came down to a pair of contenders, Mordekaiser the Iron Revenant and Yorick the Shepherd of Souls. It's funny, if you asked me for the best necromancer in League back when I started playing 11 years ago, this would be no contest for Yorick. Both champions underwent major revisions in their skill sets and lore, and Mordekaiser's original title was the champion of Noxus known as the Master of Metal. Basically, his whole thing was being an album cover. Aside from his soul-stealing ultimate, his abilities were more in metal manipulation, or ferromancy as I like to call it. Now he's actually a formless wraith inhabiting a suit of armor with a mace made out of souls and the power to defy death itself through sheer willpower. Yorick started out as a retired gravedigger, retired on the count of death, who had to guide ghosts of the departed to their final destination before he could go on to his. A couple years back, he was reinvented as a sixth sense I see dead people kid who was trained by monks before getting caught in Viego's black mist, only instead of dying like most people, he got sick new powers and a new posse following him. Possibly because of the blessed water that he has on his neck. He retains the ability to summon spirits, but also has more of a Shaolin monk fighting style with his trusty shovel. So while Mordekaiser has leaned more into necromancy over the past decade, Yorick leaned ever so slightly away. He remains one of my favorite champions, but alas poor Yorick, I'm going with Mordekaiser. A warlord in life, Mordekaiser believed that by being a badass barbarian conqueror, he would be guaranteed Valhalla when he died. When his time came, however, he arrived in a sort of purgatory, an empty and grey wasteland to wander ceaselessly until he faded into oblivion. Instead of merely accepting his new forever home, the Kaiser persevered, his sheer anger and will keeping him from fading until he found some sorcerers gullible enough to revive him. After promptly slaying his beneficiaries, Mordekaiser found he'd absorbed energy from his time in limbo that made him stronger than ever and led a war from atop his immortal bastion. He was eventually slain again, but you fools, that was all part of the plan. For all the while, Mordekaiser had been manipulating the souls of his victims just before killing them. When he arrived back in the afterworld, which he now had claimed for his own, he found those warped souls waiting for him, his new army, from which he built an even stronger empire until the day he can invade mortality for the last time. You really can't keep a good necromancer down. To the untrained eye, Mordekaiser's combat might look more like weapon mastery. But not only is Mordekaiser's mace made of dead people, all of his abilities involve the manipulation of souls in some way. As Mordekaiser deals damage to others, he can convert some of their life force into more damage in follow-up attacks. He can also do this in a quick burst with his obliterate skill. 
Any damage Mordekaiser takes or deals is stored in a backup meter, which he can then transform into a protective shield, kind of the necromantic version of his old shrapnel force shields. He can fire ghostly claws with death's grasp, and the piece de resistance, his ultimate realm of death. Similar to Jules' Land of the Dead, actually, but way more metal. Here, Mordekaiser can transport himself and a single opponent into his territory, the Death World, where they're forced to fight mano a mano. Not gonna be easy, as the whole time Mordekaiser is stealing their energy to raise his own stats, and if Mordekaiser kills his opponent, he gets to keep the stat buffs. He just ate their soul. Well, until they respawn. But I imagine if respawning weren't a necessary mechanic for MOBAs, this would be a bigger deal. Any attempt to harm the Kaiser only makes him stronger, war is his sustenance, and death is always on the menu. He doesn't raise the dead because he doesn't need to. He's using the dead as a battery, like a necrotic energizer bunny. And I'd be remiss not to mention that he also started a metal band called Pentakill that's taken Runeterra by storm. It kind of exists as its own alternate universe now, but there was a time when this band was completely canon. And that's hilarious! He's not my favorite dead guy in League, but for the sake of today's list, Mordekaiser earns his spot as Numero Cuatro. Y you see, because of the meme, because he was popular in Brazil, the joke that he was Numero Uni? Man, I've been playing this game too long. <laughs> It's standard practice for necromancers to extend their stay on the planet, living through phylacteries and self-resurrection for up to thousands of years. But few necromancers have been added for as many real-world years as Quan Chi, first appearing in Mortal Kombat 4 in 1997 and still making appearances today. Well, technically his first appearance was in Defenders of the Realm, a god-awful animated series, <laughs> and then Mortal Kombat Mythology Sub-Zero. But that's a thing with necromancers, they do anything to survive, even if it means appearing in something dead on arrival. So, Mortal Kombat 4. After the defeat of Shang Tsung and Shao Kahn in the original trilogy, Mortal Kombat needed a new big bad, and Quan Chi filled that role. Vicariously. He actually serves an elder god named Shinnok and works to reconstitute him. And in the meantime, he uses Shinnok's amulet to empower his spellcraft, making him the most feared spellcaster Outrealm has ever seen. Quan Chi's most basic form of necromancy are these phantasmagorical floating skulls. These can theoretically kill a target instantly, though this being Mortal Kombat, most of his opponents are either gods, demons, cyborgs, or mortals of incredible spiritual resilience, all able to tank at least a few of these projectiles. This is where Quan Chi's martial arts mastery comes in handy, allowing him to defend himself long enough to unload several more skull blasts. He also has portal magic, but not just the Doctor Strange sling ring kind. Quan Chi can open doorways to other dimensions to effortlessly pull himself or others through, including the Mortal Kombat equivalent of Heaven, Hell, Limbo, and so on. To Quan Chi, crossing the veil between life and death is as easy as opening a refrigerator, and he can empower his magic with the souls of the dead in a similar fashion to Mordekaiser, or offer up those souls to empower others, as he does with his fellow soul-eating wizard Shang Tsung when they form their deadly alliance. If he doesn't have a clear shot to insta-kill or the time to raise a zombie minion, he can grasp an opponent's soul and rewrite it on the fly, effectively live zombifying them and causing them to march stupidly toward him for a combo setup. He'll even summon demon bats from the nether realm, the Mortal Kombat equivalent of hell. I can imagine some fans were expecting Scorpion for this list, who also summons demons and drags enemies to the nether realm, where he's much more powerful. But ask yourself, where did Scorpion get these powers? Quan Chi! Who killed Scorpion's people and manipulated him through the Mortal Kombat tournament? Quan Chi. Who restored Sub-Zero from his cybernetic form everyone hated? Quan Chi. Who hijacked Onaga's undead army, made Shang Tsung look like a first year at Hogwarts, and killed Liu Kang and brought him back as a zombie? Okay, that last one is actually Raiden, but it only illustrates that necromancy is a difficult art beyond the skill of a lightning god. If Quan Chi had done it, he'd have done it better. Once when facing off against Raiden, Quan Chi instantly rezzed Kung Lao, Jade, Kitana, Jax, Cyber Sub-Zero, Striker, Nightwolf, Sindel, Smoke, and Cabal all at once. All completely under his control as a flex. But my favorite Quan Chi trick of all, one word, Soulmado. 
a magical vacuum that pulls all of the souls from heaven to be used for the darkest of magics. Imagine chilling out in heaven after a lifetime of good deeds, only to get yanked into a Duracell for the bald bastard. Any of the Elder Gods want to weigh in on this? No? Just Shinnok? And he's backing Quan Chi! You'd be hard pressed to find a catastrophe in the series that Quan Chi didn't either help cause or help resolve. He's got his grubby little hands in everything. I mean, again, Chronicle Sub-Zero. If he can come back from that, he can come back from anything. <laughs> How unfortunate. Quan Chi wins. Oh god, back to Blizzard. Activision Blizzard has revealed itself to be the true villain of the new decade. With several sacrifices made to the god of crunch culture, draconian litigation against fan projects, and workplace misconduct that wouldn't fly in a George Orwell novel, I wish I could ignore the company the same way it ignored complaints against its executives and basic human decency for the past several years. But I've never let the corruption of the business side stop me from talking about the creativity at play in the developer's office, and Warcraft's had some pretty great villains. So let's go back to a better time. A six year period where Warcraft was in its heyday and any atrocities behind the scenes were at least behind the scenes. Some longtime fans I consulted with recommended Kel Thusad of the Scourge, who to be fair is a great character, but I think part of why he's so popular is due to his association with an even more popular villain, who taught him everything he knew and made him into the lich he is today. It's pretty hard to beat the guy who raised you. I'm talking, of course, about Arthas the Lich King. Or, rather, the Lich King entity itself. There's a lot of lore here, but I'll thumb through it as fast as I can. Try to keep up, this will be on the test later. So back in Draenor, there's an orc shaman named Nerjul. Great start, because as I mentioned earlier, necromancy has its earliest roots in shamanism. Nerjul doesn't like the fact that the orcs are working with demons, but when he speaks up, Dreadlord Kiel Jaden had him cancelled, and the only way he can be redeemed to the Horde is to be transformed into the Lich King. Lich King is sent to Azeroth as a suit of armor trapped in a block of ice, the Frozen Throne. He's trapped here, but able to create a contagious plague that wipes through the countryside and instantly zombifies anyone it kills. From Northrend, Lich King is able to control not only the plague itself, but every resulting undead and he's soon a general of hundreds of thousands of troops. Meanwhile, the Alliance is struggling to keep up, and one paladin named Arthas gets so frustrated that he goes kinda evil. Lich King lures Arthas to a new source of power, the mighty sword Frostmourn, through which Arthas is turned to the dark side and directly controlled by the Lich King. So from this point forward, everything Arthas does is largely the work of the Lich King himself. Eventually, Arthas treks up to the Frozen Throne, donning the possessed armor and fusing his soul with Ner'Jules to become a more complete Lich King, no longer bound to the Frozen Throne and free of the Dreadlord's control. What follows are bad times. It might feel like cheating combining Ner'Jul and Arthas' feats here, but the way I see it, they're both extensions of the same ultimate necromancer. So let's list their triumphs. Creating an insta-zombie plague, defeating the Nerubians that were immune to the plague and zombifying them anyway, turning Anubarak the Spider King into an undead superbug, turning Sylvanas Windrunner into a banshee, corrupting the Elves' Well of Life into a Well of Undeath, teaching Kel'Thuzad necromancy before which he could barely raise rats, turning a slain Kel'Thuzad into a lich using the Well of Undeath, beating Illidan in a duel, raising Sindragosa as an undead frostworm, and allowing the best player characters in WoW to storm his citadel, only to take their souls effortlessly after a few minutes of pretending it was a fair fight. He would have won if Tyrion Forgering didn't deus ex machina the situation and save the raiding party, though it still took like a dozen champions to take him down. The Lich King mantle even persisted after this, with Bolvar Fordragon assuming the role to keep Arthas' undead legions from swarming across Azeroth unchecked. I feel like Bolvar could have just commanded them all to jump in a volcano and be done with it, but I guess that's not allowed, so instead, the new Lich King hung around to attract nostalgic fans back whenever things became stale, until recently when Sylvanas killed him because she's the creator's current favorite. Ugh. The Lich King's reign over Azeroth was a moment in time. A whole fictional world in peril, the Alliance and the Horde setting aside their differences, literally millions of players fighting against the Lich King's forces, all trying to get to this guy. It was a thing of beauty. But looking at WoW today? Well, it has more in common with the frozen set of armor than the mighty Dark Paladin. 
the plot spinning its wheels making increasingly divisive story decisions, and rather than feeling like a world to explore, WoW has become a passionless list of dailies more about making your numbers go up than being part of a community. It makes me yearn for the days when we fought the Lich King. Meanwhile, other MMOs like Final Fantasy XIV are doing better than ever. With the best story arcs Blizzard can come up with seemingly in the past and the avalanche of PR disasters burying them, there's never been a better time to quit the world of Warcraft. If I wasn't so mad at Blizzard, I probably would have put the Lich King at number one without much consideration. But that moment of hesitation allowed me to reevaluate the other entries, and one last resurrection is squeaked past Old Arthas. Don't get me wrong, it was close. But taking a page from the power scaling community, I started to think about each necromancer in terms of their sphere of influence, how big of a force they can amass or oppose. Elise and the Castle Crashers necromancer can protect small hideouts or raise small but elite squads. The Necro Dancer is protecting a much larger dungeon, whereas Jewel is able to penetrate such a dungeon. Valdor ranked a little lower for not being incredibly versatile, but he's up there with Mordekaiser and Quan Chi in terms of scope, pulling together legions that could easily overtake a continent. The Lich King gets frighteningly close to conquering a planet, and there's only one necromancer that I can think of that tops even that. Well, also Thanatos, who physicalizes the very concept of death itself, but he was almost disqualified because I just don't think he's very interested in the topic. But at the same time, it turns out Thanatos isn't the only incarnation of death on this list. So rise from your seats and from your graves for our number one necromancer, Grave Lord Nito. Dark Souls lore is a cryptic thing. Few who play the game ever learn the backstory, they just know that they die a lot. But can you believe it that if it weren't for Nito, there would be no death in Dark Souls at all? Back in the ancient past, there was no death, no life, no light or darkness, or good or evil. There was simply the overworld, ruled by immortal dragons, and the underground, an endless expanse of grey nothingness until the first flame came into existence, and with it four great figures. The furtive pygmy who invented humanity, the witch of Izalith who invented life for them, Lord Gwyn who created light and by association darkness, and Nito who made death. Something for humans to do when they're done being alive. High concept stuff, but very effective in defeating the dragons above. Gwyn used the flames to split their scales, and Nito used his newly invented death to stop them once and for all. So, yeah, we got the instant death spells down, powerful enough to topple mother effing dragons! This beckoned in an age of flame, where humans prospered and built great kingdoms, but it wasn't made to last. In time, the first flame, source of light and life, began to dim, and Gwyn's group struggled to find the solution. The Witch of Izalith tried to make a new flame, and that went horribly wrong. So Nito and Gwyn worked out a way to link humanity back to the flame, fueling it whenever someone dies. That's why bonfires are so important in Dark Souls, by the way. But it turns out humanity isn't a renewable resource. There just weren't enough people to keep the flame lit. So next level problem solving, Nito begrudgingly makes it so that everyone who dies comes back as an undead. And that's why you always respawn in Dark Souls, and why you have to fight to get your full health bar back. Your repeated deaths are being used to fuel the first flame again, and again, and again. Humanity itself wrung out like a wet rag to feed every last drop possible into the shrinking embers, trying in vain to prolong the age of man. The point I'm getting at here is that Nito's very existence shapes reality itself, and he can change the rules of life and death seemingly on a whim, re-engineering how souls are collected in order to maximize their use throughout the world. Though he seems a little conflicted on the matter. Nito hosts a covenant of Gravelord servants, which you, the player, can join, and doing so allows players to invade other game worlds, the save files of other players, leading them to more deaths and more kerosene for the flame. So I guess you can say Nito's dominion over death spreads to multiple realities. But Nito is an artist and finds Gwyn's new soul economy has cheapened the impact of death. 
so he waits at the bottom of the Tomb of the Giants, behind countless masses of marrow which serves as a test, waiting for an adventurer to prove themselves strong enough to end Gwyn's Age of Light. So, in one way, it will mean the end of death. But in another, it will also be the end of life. And that is the greatest death of all. A giant himself, the Gravelord stands 9 feet tall, wearing an umber cloak and adorned with the bodies of several other skeletons. An entire cemetery rushing at you from the shadows. But despite this initial shock, Nito is considered to be in the easier half of the Dark Souls bosses. That is to say, the traps he laid before his tomb are more treacherous than Nito himself, but he still has some tricks up his radius and ulna. Smaller skeletons will swarm you if you stay still, while Nito himself slashes through them carelessly, hoping that when he's done, you'll be among the resulting heap of body parts. He'll also unleash a Miasma attack, a simplified version of the same one used to slay the dragons. If you can outrun his minions and get behind him, you can hack away, safe from his sword dance and only needing to backstep from the spreading Miasma. Goes down pretty easily for a number one spot, huh? I don't know, something about this encounter always felt off to me. Well, I look at it this way. I really think he's happy that you were able to best him, and that he hopes that you'll be the one to defeat Gwyn and return the world to oblivion. Life just isn't fun for him anymore. A necromancer's job is to raise the dead and... Well, just about every person in the world he's already raised. Countless times. His zombies raise zombies. Is this really supposed to be a boss fight? It feels more like a retirement party. A farewell with little emotion knowing that you too will soon join him. So for co-opting life, inventing death, and literally wearing it like his finest vestments, I name Gravelord Nito as the number one necromancer in video games. Every time you die in this game, and every time you wake up to try again, you have Nito to thank. I am the Green Scorpion, and thank you for joining me on this reinvigorating topic. But don't get comfortable just yet. Halloween is just around the corner after all. So next time... Round two, horror games.